Well, one day before the 80th anniversary of D-Day, Germans are being told, get ready for war, clear out your basements as a place to seek shelter, as World War III seems inevitable. This according to Der Spiegel this morning, the German newspaper, cellar instead of bunker, where the Germans should she seek shelter in case of war. And for good reason, right now, uh, we are slow marching towards nuclear war, and Europe is about to become the largest staging ground for NATO forces to attack Russia. Uh, so over the past 24 hours, we learn in the Telegraph in the UK that, quote, NATO is developing multiple land corridors to rush U.S. troops and armor to the front lines in the event of a major European ground war with Russia. Here you can see these land corridors here on your map here on the screen. Over 300,000 U.S. troops deployed up through Norway, through the Netherlands, through Italy, through Greece, and Turkey. So what exactly is happening, uh, this inevitable escalation? Let's ask, at, let's ask Alexander Mercurius from the Duran, who is kind enough to uh, give us some time today to talk about these latest developments. Alexander, I am sick as a sin, so I'm going to let you do all of the talking <laughs> if I can. What do you make of this, uh, this telegraph piece and this sort of telegraphing of NATO's plans? Well, what is happening is that the Russians are winning in Ukraine. This this is what is behind all of the hysteria, the panic, the, the, the plans, the schemes, the provocations, the idea of allowing Ukraine to launch missiles and carry out shelling attacks inside Russian territory, the creation of the land corridors, all of those things. It is because the Russians now are conclusively winning the war in Ukraine. The Western powers, the United States, and even more so the European powers, which are extremely overinvested and very exposed in this conflict, have made a massive investment in Ukraine, not just over the last three years, uh, the years of the war, but going back many, many uh, years before that. And I mean, they had this huge plan, this idea that, you know, they would be able to push Russia back, they would be able to push it eastwards. Some of them even had hopes that Russia might break up or something of that kind if Ukraine were brought into NATO, into the European family, as it was called. What they have found instead is that what their actions have done is that they have provoked Russia and conjured up um, this massive Russian war machine that is now clanking in their direction. And this is creating panic and hysteria across Europe and among some people in Washington who suddenly discovered that they're not as powerful as they thought they were and that the Russians aren't as weak as that they thought they were. And so they're coming up with these um, equally dangerous and reckless proposals uh, to rush troops to the border, to prepare for nuclear war, to get people to hide in cellars and to do all of these things without, of course, ever admitting the truth that the only reason we are in this crisis at all, that we have found ourselves in this position, is because our foreign policy, our relations with Russia have been mismanaged to an astonishing degree um, for the last 30 years ever since the end of the Cold War. It has been the greatest failure of Western policy since the Versailles Treaty of 1990. You mentioned money, this massive investment. Is, is that what it comes down to? This massive investment of land and mineral resources and rebuilding? We heard Zelensky say he wants to turn Ukraine into the next Israel. Is that what this is all about, that they see this now slipping away, slipping through their hands, and you have all of these billion-dollar investment firms that have poured money and resources into this, um, and they're seeing it slipping away now? It's three-quarters that. It is indeed, I mean, there is this massive investment, and it is slipping away. But there is something else, and it's not to be underestimated. And you mentioned the Daily Telegraph. There's an article in the Daily Telegraph about about it as about this as well which is that along with the investment the investment of money and resources and intelligence assets and weapon systems and plans and schemes and all of that there is a fear of a massive loss of credibility that a defeat for the west in ukraine or for 
the United States, but also for Western Europe, for the Western European powers, for the European Union, NATO, all of that, will show that the emperor is not without clothes, but that the emperor doesn't have as many clothes as he believed he did. And, and that is what they're afraid of, that uh, in a time when, again, they have sought adversarial relationships with all sorts of powerful countries around the world, China, Iran, um, even to some extent friends or purported friends like Brazil, um, Turkey, um, that suddenly the West will not look as powerful, as overwhelmingly strong as it has looked up to this point. And that is something that is frightening them, frightening them and driving them mad. One should not overlook the financial and material aspects of the overinvestment as well. An awful lot of people are going to be very, very badly burnt. And of course, an awful lot of people make an awful lot of money out of Ukraine and money always talks. But the psychological aspect of the effect of a Western defeat in Ukraine should not be underestimated either. When you look at this land corridors, and I understand from from my research anyway, that the, the idea of having large sort of staging bases like in Iraq or Afghanistan, as the Telegraph points out, that, that those are those are anachronistic, right? These large bases would be destroyed by Russia sort of immediately. So you can't have these large staging bases anymore. Can you describe to our audience what a land corridor would look like when we talk about hundreds of thousands of troops going up through Norway, going through the Netherlands, going through Italy, Greece, and Turkey? Would we just see a, a constant steady stream of troops and materiel? Is that what a land corridor would look like? No, I think what it would mean is that these are um, um, routes through which troops could, mo could move without encountering the usual kind of bureaucratic and administrative obstacles which exist in Europe because, of course, it's important to remember that Europe, unlike the United States, is not a single country. It's not a single political unit. It is still, to a very great extent, subdivided into many, into many small states which, to a greater or lesser degree, prize their independence. So the idea is negotiate now create these corridors, allowing these troops to move along these particular designated lines, and they, they'll be able to move fast, and that the borders through which they move, in effect, will not exist. Now, I have to say, this is not a new plan or a new proposal. It's been floated. The first time I heard about it, I think it was about 20 years ago, which is you know long before we had a crisis now. But it, it's it's been discussed. It's never really been acted upon. Suddenly, there is the, this panic now to accelerate it and to bring it all together and to make it work because suddenly the threat from the East is supposed to be looming. Will Russia sit back? I mean, we saw NATO members okay, uh, okaying the use of jets to strike in Russia. We saw high Mars attacks over the past 48 hours into, into Russia, 20, 30 miles inside of Russia, hitting uh, civilian infrastructure, once again, hitting civilian buses and, and, and other uh, civilian infrastructure. I, we, we keep hearing Russia say, we are going, you know, Poland and these other areas, we're, we're not going to sit back and you keep doing this, we are ready to, we are ready to protect ourselves. And this is an existential crisis for Russia. At what point do you think the bear has been poked enough that we see a, a major response? Right. Well, the Russians have um, basically spoken about this. Putin himself has done. And um, if you listen uh, to what he has said, if you read what he said carefully, for him, the ultimate red line, the, the point where if the West crosses, they will respond, will be if cruise missiles or ballistic missiles are launched into Russia. And he specifically discussed missiles like the Attackums, the uh, Storm Shadow, the French Scalp, the German Taurus missile. His point was that these are weapons that can only be operated by Ukraine with the direct assistance and involvement of Western militaries. 
Ukraine cannot launch attack of missiles unless the programming is done by US technicians. And the same applies to an equal or sometimes even greater extent with all of the other missiles. So he says, if you start launching these missiles at our territory, then what that means is that you are directly attacking our territory. You, Germany, France, Britain, the United States are attacking us. And in that kind of situation, we will be obliged to respond. And he's spoken about responding against military assets in other places. He has reminded the Europeans that the Russians are able to launch cruise missiles at any point in Europe. He reminded the Europeans also that um, some of their countries have very dense populations, a rather chilling comment, actually, right. a very threatening comment. And he also very pointedly said to the Americans, because one gets the sense that the Europeans on this are even more aggressive than the Americans are. He said to the Americans, look, if we get into this situation where the Europeans are launching missiles at us and we feel we have to respond by launching missiles at them, what are you expecting to do given that we possess nuclear strategic parity with you? In other words, he was saying that if you don't get this whole situation under control, you could find yourself in an all out nuclear war with us, with Russia. So I think that is his red line. Now, he's spoken about this very clearly. He said this, by the way, before the announcement that was made last week, green lighting the use of weapons, Western weapons against Russia by Ukraine. And it was striking that the Americans excluded the Atakans and by extension, the storm shadows and the scalps from the types of weapons that could be used in this way. So for the moment, at least, they're showing that they both understand the Russian red lines and are respecting them. But we can't count on that indefinitely, because up to this point, there has been no red line, whether it's been a real Russian one or a one that the West has imposed upon itself, that the Western powers in this conflict have not eventually crossed. Right, exactly. All of them have been crossed by the Western powers, it seems, up till this point. And how long until Russia says enough is enough with HIMARS attacks into Beograd region and other areas in the civilian infrastructure? You're using American-provided HIMARS to continue to attack. They don't reach to the level of cruise missiles. But still, this is exactly, this is, of course, exactly the red line for Russia in the Donbass, the continued yeah. attack on the Donbass for, you know, since 2014. Uh, and so I'll get you out of here on this, Alexander, which is when you see last week, I think in the UK or maybe a week and a half ago in the UK specifically, uh, you know, they were warning you're in London warning folks, you know, stock up on food, stock up on food supplies, water, make sure you have supplies, uh, Germany over the past 24 hours telling Citizens, you know, prepare your your cellars. We don't think you should go to large scale bunker situations. Get ready for your basements to be used. Um, what 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 do you make of those? Is it scare tactics to kind of ready the populace for this, the inevitability, or or something else? It it, it shows divided tactics because on the one hand, European governments have been going out of their way to reassure, reassure their populations that the West can escalate indefinitely in Ukraine without provoking a Russian reaction. So, you know, don't worry, you know, if we launch attacks on Russia, well, you know, the Russians are just bluffing. We shouldn't take this very seriously. Their nuclear warnings aren't real. We can just go on doing this um, as long as we want and to the, whatever extent that we wish, because there's not really going to be a Russian reaction. So that's the main message that they're giving. But at the same time, they're now giving this absolutely contradictory message, which is that actually the Russians are coming. World War Three is on its way. You've all got to prepare. What they're trying to do is that on the one hand, they don't want to panic their populations, which might turn them against the war. And at the same time, they want their populations committed to the war, at, even despite the gathering economic crisis in Europe. 
and in Britain as well, by the way. So what they're trying to do is, on the one hand, they're saying, you know, it's don't worry, we can escalate however much we want, but the Russians are a threat. The Russians are coming, and we must prepare against it against them. It's completely contradictory, but in the media space that exists in Europe, which is become extremely controlled now there is no one unfortunately to point out the contradictions well that's why you guys continue to do a great job at the duran and uh, we're thrilled to have you on here alexander mercurius we always appreciate you joining us and providing some insights um one of the smartest one of the smartest individuals on, on the case uh, if you will alexander great to see you thank you so much for joining us we really appreciate it thank you very much clayton and thank you for your very kind words just now